Relearning how to do things that you've been doing the same way for a long time can be a difficult yet rewarding process. This entails discarding old habits, routines, or knowledge in favor of learning new ways to execute tasks or think about problems. Today's edition of Jamaica Magazine will show you how to do just that. Hi, I'm your host Audrey Williams and today we'll look at strategies to welcome change that may be applied to all facets of our lives. So stay with us, we'll be back after the news. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry, and this is your GIS News for Friday, June 14, 2024. The Constitutional Reform Committee, CRC, guiding Jamaica's transition to a republic state, is planning comprehensive discussions on the island's final court. While making her sectoral presentation in Parliament earlier this week, Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs Marlene Malahu Fort said the country would have to begin a serious conversation about the options that are open to Jamaica. These discussions will extend well beyond the CRC. It will involve the people directly. We will facilitate opportunities for the people both to learn about the options for the country and to express their views on the preferred path the country should take. Meanwhile, the committee is moving to prepare drafting instructions for the substantive bill to transition Jamaica from a constitutional monarchy to a republic. When the bill comes to the House, it will have to be laid for three months before it can be debated on. It is the intention to use the first three months to hear from the people and to further inform the people about the bill. The proposal is for the bill to be reviewed by a joint select committee of the parliament. After the bill is debated on, Another three months will have to elapse before it is voted on. And we will take into account the points raised during the debate. After the bill is passed in the House of Representatives, this honorable house, it will go to the Senate. The government is hoping to finalize work on the Southern Coastal Highway Improvement Project by the end of this financial year. While touring the eastern end of the project, Minister with Responsibility for Works, Robert Morgan, said he was happy with the progress. According to the minister, other roads across the island will benefit from the kind of infrastructure being installed on the Southern Coastal Highway. One of the important things about this project is that it's not just a road project. It's a project that has roads, it has, it has water, it has drainage, it has also internet, internet as well. And I think the vision that went behind it, led by Prime Minister Andrew Wallace, is something that every single road in Jamaica is now going to benefit from, a kind of holistic development. We're about to start the SPARC program, and that is also going to be a facet of the SPARC program, where we're not just laying down asphalt, we're also putting in the necessary infrastructure, not just for today's needs, but also for future development. The minister also passed by the construction of the Morant Bay Urban Center and said he was happy with its progress. He was accompanied by Member of Parliament Michelle Charles and Councillor Michael McLeod, along with representatives of the National Works Agency, the China Harbor Engineering Company and Stanley Jamaica Engineers Consultants. 2,000 helmets are being made available to motorcyclists as part of a road safety initiative focused on encouraging bikers to wear the protective headgear. Minister of National Security Dr. Horace Chang handed over the units, which are valued at $28 million, to the National Helmet Wearing Coalition on Wednesday. He says it's hoped their use will contribute to a reduction in motorcycle-related fatalities. The government will have to continue to somehow assist in the road safety committee to get more bikers riding um, with safe support with, with helmets. Of course, helmets are not the only safety support they have. We have to get more of them wearing um, bike leggings and elbow protection. I don't know how, we, how strong we can get them on. Maybe some of the local tradesmen will acquire part of leather and begin to build them because to import them is also a big cost. 
The availability of these helmets will support our public awareness campaigns and educational initiatives. We can now plan helmet distribution activities where we can demonstrate the proper use of these helmets and to reduce to reduce the you know the the, the, the the culture of not wearing a helmet and to get the proper safety protocols in place. Data from the National Road Safety Council indicates that since 2012, over 600 motorcyclists have been killed on Jamaican roads. The Island Traffic Authority is also reporting 153 deaths from motorcycle collisions in 2023. Of that number, 135 were motorcyclists and 18 were pillion passengers. A group of cruise executives was invited to the Falmouth Artisan Village on Wednesday with the hopes of having it be on the itinerary for cruise passengers. Guided by the director of the Tourism Enhancement Fund, Carl Rose Brown, the group of approximately 40 people set out to see the offerings. Ms. Brown says the team is primarily interested in connecting with cruise companies for the Artisan Village, which is an attraction on the port. We're very happy they came and we believe they liked what they saw. Our conversations with them indicated that they liked what they saw. We hope that at the end of the day, they go back to their offices and say, we need to think about adding the artisan village at Falmouth as an attraction, which we will include on the offerings. The Falmouth Artisan Village was officially opened by Prime Minister Andrew Holness in April of this year. The Ministry of Education and Youth is calling on principals to support and actively participate in the School Garden Initiative. It's part of a collective effort between the ministry and educational institutions nationwide aimed at encouraging schools to grow the food they consume. Permanent Secretary in the ministry, Dr. Casson Troop, made the appeal during the National School Garden Project Exhibition held recently at Denby High School in Clarendon. She implored the principals to look beyond the immediate school scope of the project and see its potential for broader collaboration and impact. So the journey from farm to the table is not merely a physical one. It is a profound reflection of our choices, our values and our future. By cultivating school gardens, we empower students to become stewards of the land, to appreciate the hard work that goes into growing food and to savor the flavors of fresh locally grown Produce. The 2024 National School Garden Exhibition held in conjunction with Caribbean Nutrition Day featured primary and secondary institutions that participated in the Ministry's School Garden competition. The schools competed in several categories including the Most Outstanding or Most Sustainable School Garden and Special Recognition for Innovation. Bethabara Primary and Roger Clark High were the overall champions. And finally, application is now open for the Summer of Skills program being offered by the Heart NSTA Trust. The program, which is free, will run for three weeks in July and August. It will include areas that are taught under the Technical Vocational Educational and Training TVET curriculum. At the launch on Wednesday, Managing Director Dr. Tanisha Ingleton said the participants would be equipped with entrepreneurial skills. They will also be exposed to innovation and technology, get a better appreciation for cultural expressions, and receive training in industry-relevant areas. Then, of course, there's the incalculable piece, the personal growth, that investment, certainly it's not something that we can really calculate what is it that individuals get from being at the heart in SDA Trust? We will be able to foster confidence, teamwork, and leadership skills through interactive workshops and collaborative projects. The program will be operated across the agency's 28 institutions island-wide. Persons being targeted are children at the primary school level and youth who want practical skills for employment and entrepreneurship and those who are passionate about the creative arts. Applications can be made in person at the agency's regional offices or online at heartnstatrust.gov.jm. And you can also uh, focus your attention on the institution that is closest to you to see which program will be offered in your vicinity. And of course, our parish offices and institutions will be there with the staff members to provide the kind of guidance 
through our career counselors and program coordinators to ensure that persons are enrolling in the appropriate programs. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. The Joint Select Committee of Parliament reviewing the Domestic Violence Act wants to hear from you. Review the act and share your opinions with the committee. You can find a copy of the act on the Parliament's website at www.japarliament.gov.jm under the heading Publications. Once you've reviewed the act, submit your written opinions by Friday, June 14, 2024 to Clark to the Houses Gordon House, 81 Duke Street, Kingston, or email them at clark at japarliament.gov.jm. Let your voice be heard. Thank you for staying with us. As we look at discarding old habits, we have to first understand why relearning is necessary. For starters, it allows us to adjust because many of our everyday responsibilities are subject to change in a culture that is constantly growing. Take for example our learning environment. Embracing the concept of change will revolutionize not only how we teach but also how we learn. Transforming Education for National Development trend is being implemented by the Ministry of Education and Youth and is focused on positioning Jamaica to become a more globally competitive nation. One of the seven pillars that will guide the sector's change is teaching, curriculum and teacher training. This guide underscores the critical need for continuous training, mentorship and support for educators. By investing in their professional growth, the ministry aims to elevate teaching practices, thereby improving student outcomes and driving the nation's educational advancement. When we think about Pillar 3, we recognize that whatever the curriculum is promoting, our teaching should be consistent with that. And it means as well that if we're helping people to grow, to develop, to implement the curriculum, we must be on the same page as well when it comes to teacher preparation. This is why when we think about Pillar 3, we should pay attention to the persons who are involved. So we see here we have parents and we have content coming from different individuals. We have educators, we have the learners. And we're seeing that at the core of all of this when it comes to teaching and learning is the actual interaction of people as well as what happens with our curriculum. Based on the evaluation of the education system, there are about four major recommendations that I would love for us to consider. And you can use an acronym to deal with that. The acronym, if we're making use of our cognitive strategies, NCCS. N is about our national philosophy for education. The recommendation was that it be learner-centered. The learner is at the core of everything that we're doing. Now, I want us to consider ourselves too as learners because when you are actually participating in professional development activities, you become a learner. Curriculum implementation is basically about us changing. So if we have a new curriculum, it is about a new way of teaching. We are being exposed professionally to opportunities to change how we teach. We have to now be checking if what we're doing is leading to the change. We need to work as a community, we need to be more integrative in our approach to teaching, and we should pay attention to our culture and the aesthetics. Moving forward, we're depending on you to be promoters of our national philosophy. We're also opening up the door to you, we're saying, guys, just look out for the call in terms of reviewing the curriculum so you can be a part of that process. We're also working at developing a co-curricular framework and you will also be integral to this process. 
capacity building, we're going to treat learner centeredness intentionally in light of the gap that you'd have spoken about, you'd have indicated. And again, we're going to ensure that our policies are ready, our policies are consistent with our national philosophy. So as we move forward, I'm just encouraging everybody to let's get on board. Basically, under God, I pledge that I'm going to follow through in light of Pillar 3. your money is now tax free know that the income tax threshold has been increased your government is looking after you responsibly so our economy can do even more for you the proceeding was brought to you by the office of the prime minister relearning improves efficiency by reminding us that there is better faster or more efficient methods to do tasks that we may be unaware of applying this might even save a life You're up and about going through your routine activities. Suddenly you collapse without warning. Your heart stops beating and within seconds you stop breathing. A quick check shows there's no pulse. All signs of sudden cardiac arrest. Sudden cardiac arrest, SCA, is a condition in which the heart unexpectedly stops beating. When this happens, blood stops flowing to the brain and other vital organs. The person may die if not treated within minutes. So the way you decide if, there's, if they're having sudden cardiac arrest is in addition to seeing if they're conscious, calling to them and seeing if there's any response, you need to feel for a pulse. So you would feel at the neck, at the angle of the jaw, or you could lis you know, listen for the heartbeat by putting your ear to the patient's chest. You need to see if they're breathing. So if they are not breathing, they have no pulse, then they are in cardiac arrest. SCA is not to be confused with a heart attack, which happens when blood flow to the heart is blocked. However, a heart attack can lead to sudden cardiac arrest. Another way to look at it is, a heart attack is a circulation problem, while sudden cardiac arrest is an electrical one. The immediate cause of most SCAs is an abnormal heart rhythm as the electrical activities of the heart becomes chaotic and the heart is unable to pump blood to the rest of the body. We're all at risk for sudden cardiac death, so we need to know our numbers and our status. What is your blood pressure? Do you know what your blood pressure is? Do you know what your cholesterol is? So we might be a walking time bomb and we don't know. It's not just people who appear healthy who are at risk. Somebody can be overweight and you say, oh, they're bound to drop down, but somebody who is thin can drop down as well. It just depends what the other risk factors are. So I just think the only way we can know is to know your numbers, know your status. Among the conditions that trigger sudden cardiac arrest is coronary artery disease, a more common cause in persons over 35 years old. Also, cardiomyopathy in which the heart muscle becomes enlarged or thick and weak, as well as inherited disorders that may cause parts of the heart to stretch and become weak. Other conditions include disorders of the heart's electrical system, as well as heart defects that were exhibited at birth. Persons who have a family history of sudden cardiac arrest or heart disease are also at risk. In contrast to elderly persons, cases of SCA is not prevalent in children. But the children can be born with some types of heart disease that make them uh, have a higher risk for sudden cardiac arrest. That is usually picked up if they have, sometimes at birth, because of the abnormalities, but even if they are corrected, they can still have an increased risk of sudden cardiac arrest. Highlighted cases of SCA in student athletes in recent years prompted increased focus on evaluation for the physically active. I would like to, to encourage all parents, if you have a child who is involved in any team sport, any physical activity, or even a lot of physical activity, and if they are not on a team, to please have your child checked. Carry them for sudden cardiac arrest screening. We have it at the Heart Foundation, we can come island-wide or go to your GP and have your child tested. A victim of sudden cardiac arrest can survive with the quick action of a bystander who is able to apply immediately cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. You will start resuscitative efforts which will include compressing the chest in order to get the heart going. You may or may not breathe for them. Nowadays it is not, you know, a lot of bystanders 
balk at starting CPR because they don't want to put their mouth on the patient's mouth. And I mean, that's a real concern. Studies were done a couple of years ago and they determined that compression only CPR, so just pressing on the chest alone, is of value. If available, an automated external defibrillator, AED, can be used within a few minutes to restore a normal rhythm to the heart. These may be available at certain places, such as airports, stadiums and other public and business places. If someone has developed chest pain, they've grabbed their chest, they've sank to their, you know, sank down on the ground because they're having chest pain or they're not breathing properly, you don't start CPR for that. They need to get to medical attention immediately. But you would only start CPR if the patient is pulseless and not breathing. Following that bit of first intervention, which must take place within the first four to five minutes of sudden cardiac arrest, the patient will need to be moved immediately to a hospital. The Ministry of Health since 1996 has been partnering with the Ministry of Local Government through the Jamaica Fire Brigade to expand its provision of pre-hospital service. We recognize that transportation of patients to hospital is a vital part of the chain of survival. Certainly from the patient suffers an incident to the point at which they reach hospital and get care. The transportation to hospital is important and not only in terms of the time that it takes but also in terms of the support that is provided during that transport. You're supposed to have a defibrillator on the ambulance, you're supposed to have basic drugs which a trained paramedic would be able to administer to continue advanced cardiac life support and when they get to the hospital which would have been alerted from the ambulance that we're bringing in a cardiac arrest victim the team would be waiting at the door of the hospital to receive this patient. Based on the value of CPR in saving a life, the Ministry of Health has been partnering with the Heart Foundation of Jamaica to encourage more Jamaicans to get trained in CPR. And this important life skill is everybody's business, so get trained and be ready to lend a hand when the need arises. Heart NSDA Trust now offers a $100,000 grant to heart-trained individuals running businesses for over a year. They'll also assist with business planning, marketing, skill enhancement, and other support. Your government is building a caring economy for you. The proceeding was brought to you by the Office of the Prime Minister. Relearning can help identify and fix problematic habits, leading to increased productivity and profitability, particularly in customer service. Our next feature informs this reality. Effective customer service is important in all government entities that provide services to the public. The most basic customer interaction can affect an organization's reputation and their customer relationships. Here are seven elements of service excellence that will improve your service delivery. Timeliness and effectiveness. Service providers must provide prompt and accurate service in a timely manner. Effective communication. Appropriate channels should be provided to make information readily accessible and collect customer feedback. Proficiency and competency. Service providers must have the relevant technical expertise and customer service skills to satisfy the customer's needs. Responsiveness. Service providers must be quick to adapt and adopt changes to improve service to customers. Customer and people-centric. Service providers must identify and respond to the needs of their customers, whether through technological or environmental changes. Professionalism. The acceptable behaviors and attitudes that form the culture of the organization should include respect and courtesy to all customers. Service standards. Government-wide standards should be developed by the public sector and applied to each ministry, department, or agency for which the organization should be held accountable. All government entities should use the Service Excellence Policy to guide service delivery and establish a culture of service excellence in the public sector. To access the Service Excellence Policy, please visit the Public Sector Modernization Division's website today.
it comes to relearning, we frequently don't know where to begin. How do I deal with either a gain or a loss? Here's why I'm here. I'll walk you through some actions to reduce the weight of the procedure. One, recognize the need for change. Acknowledging that present practices are ineffective is the first step towards change. Two, set clear goals for relearning. Having specified, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound or SMART goals can give you a clear path and motivation. Three, conduct research and gather information from many sources, such as books, online courses, tutorials, and industry experts. Four, begin with incremental, reasonable adjustments instead of attempting to rebuild everything all at once. Five, practice consistently. Repetition is essential for relearning. Consistent practice of the new strategy will help to reinforce your learning. 6. Seek constructive comments to identify strengths and areas for improvement. 7. Relearning requires patience and persistence. Be patient with yourself and keep working hard. And finally, evaluate your progress and be open to making changes. Relearning how to accomplish something you've done one way is a transforming process. Take a minute to focus on where you need to change and begin taking those small steps. Remember that if we all undertake this new challenge, we will witness not only a change in our own personal lives, but also an impact on society as a whole. <laughs>